Good morning, family. Uh, while we wait for everybody to get their seat, uh, earlier this year I broke three ribs here on my left side. You guys prayed for me, um, and I think my ribs are healed, like completely healed. So just, uh, yeah, okay, yeah, so just thanks for praying for me, and I just wanted to give you the feedback to give praise. Okay. Today's scripture reading is from Acts 15, verse 1 to 35, so it's a bit of a long one, but uh, yeah, I'll, I'll leave the preaching to the preacher. <laughs> uh, okay, chapter 15, dispute in Antioch. Some men came down from Judah and began to teach the brothers, unless you are circumcised according to the custom prescribed by Moses, you cannot be saved. After Paul and Barnabas had engaged them in serious argument and debate, Paul and Barnabas and some others were appointed to go up to the apostles and elders in Jerusalem about this issue. When they had been sent on their way by the church, they passed through both Phoenicia and Samaria, describing in detail the conversion of the Gentiles, and they brought great joy to all the brothers and sisters. <coughs> When they arrived at Jerusalem, they were welcomed by the church, the apostles and the elders, and they reported all that God has done with them. But some of the believers who belonged to the party of the Pharisees stood up and said, this is necessary, it is necessary to circumcise them and to command them to keep the law of Moses. The apostles and the elders gathered to consider this matter. After there has been much debate, Peter stood up and said to them, brothers, you are aware that in the early days God made a choice among you that by my mouth the Gentiles would hear the gospel message and believe. And God, who, has, who knows the heart, bore witness to them by giving them the Holy Spirit, just as he also did to us. He made no distinction between us and them, cleansing their hearts by faith. Now then, why are you testing God by putting a yoke on the disciples' necks? that neither our ancestors nor we have been able to bear. On the contrary, we believe that we are saved through the grace of the Lord Jesus in the same way they are. The whole assembly became silent and listened to Barnabas and Paul describe all the signs and wonders God has done through them among the Gentiles. After they stopped speaking, James responded, Brothers, listen to me. Simeon has reported how, first, how God first intervened to take from the Gentiles a people for his name. And the words of the prophets agree with this, as it is written. After these things, I will return and rebuild David's fallen tent. I will rebuild its ruins and set it up again, so that the rest of humanity may seek the Lord, even all the Gentiles, who are called by my name, declares the Lord, who make these things known from long ago. Therefore, in my judgment, we should not cause difficulties for those among the Gentiles who turn to God, but instead we should write to them to abstain from things polluted by idols, from sexual immorality, and from eating anything that has been strangled, and from blood. For since ancient times, Moses has had those who proclaim him in every city, and every Sabbath day he is read aloud in the synagogues. Then the apostles and the elders with the whole church decided to select men who were among them and to send them to Antioch with Paul and Barnabas. Judas called Barsadas, Babas, or Sabas, and Silas, both leading men among the brothers. They wrote, From the apostles and the elders, your brothers, to the brothers and sisters among the Gentiles in Antioch, Syria, and Cilicia, greetings. Since we have heard that some, of, some without our authorization went out from us and troubled you with their words and unsettled your hearts, we have anonymous, anonymously decided to select men and send them to you along with our dearly beloved Barnabas and Paul, who have risked their lives for the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, we have sent Judas and Silas, who will personally report the same things by word of mouth. For it was the Holy Spirit's decision and ours, not to place further burdens on you beyond those requirements, that you abstain from food offered to idols, from blood, from eating anything that has been strangled, and from sexual immorality. 
You will do well if you keep yourselves from these things. Farewell. So they were sent off and went down to Antioch, and after gathering the assembly, they delivered the letter. When they read it, they rejoiced because of its encouragement. Both Judas and Silas, who were also prophets themselves, encouraged the brothers and sisters and strengthened them with a long message. After some, spending some time there, they were sent back in peace by the brothers and sisters to those who had sent them. But Paul and Barnabas, along with many others, remained in Antioch, teaching and proclaiming the word of the Lord. This is the word of the Lord. Thank you, church. My name is Lesejo, and I have the privilege of serving this body of Christ as one of the elders and pastors here. And this morning, I have the privilege of opening up God's word with you. We are today in episode three of our X season three. Over the last two episodes and weeks, we have been introduced to the missional perspective of this section of scripture as Reino guided us through being commissioned and active in sharing the gospel with others. If you have missed these, feel free to catch them on YouTube or your favorite audio podcast platform. Remember the Titans is a true story about a football coach, Herman Boone, who is played by Denzel Washington. The movie shows how a school in the 1970s navigated racial integration after the school system was desegregated desegregated. The team that already existed before the desegregation had their own coaches, had their own philosophy, had their own practices. The addition of Herman Boone, which is played by Denzel Washington, and the new players find resistance in them joining the existing team. The existing team was against change and wanted to be coached by the same coach, to maintain the same philosophy, and to remain the same. So the all-white existing team and the new black players joining eventually with the help of Denzel realized that to succeed, they must set aside their prejudice and personal differences. This is not only the same for the players, but also for the coaches in the same true story. So the team's journey is a powerful metaphor for how inclusion often means compromising personal comfort and long-held beliefs for the greater good of unity. The early church, like the football team, had to navigate significant cultural and religious differences to form a unified body. The Jerusalem Council's decision to include Gentiles without requiring them to adopt Jewish customs mirrors the film's message of unity through compromise. The Jerusalem Council's decision for unity is not only based on compromise, but firmly rooted in scripture and in an understanding of what God was already doing in setting apart the Gentiles and calling them to himself. So the council sees and is aware that the Lord does not save, but only grace alone saves. The council sees and is aware that Jewish practices can be a yoke, that can be a burden to the Gentiles, especially as those same practices are not well upheld by the Jews. The council's outcomes reframe the understanding of salvation, that salvation is seen as inclusive of Gentiles, inclusive of other nations, and fully and only by grace alone. This morning, as we look at um, three quarters of this chapter 15, which Ben read for us, thank you, Ben, for that long reading, we will use two points. The first point is the unfolding story. So I'll tell and lay a foundation for this long story, as we'll see the subplots in this long story um, that we might need to understand to come to a better understanding of what is happening within this section. There's also supporting scripture, particularly Galatians, and a few more which we will use to help us understand the dynamics of what was happening then and how we ought to understand and interpret this. So we will see the Jewish council meets. We'll see the, Jew the scene of this council meeting. So our first point will be setting that scene as this is a pivotal chapter and then line-by-line line exposition as we work through that first point. Then I'll, the second point will be a couple of observations. I'll share those at the end as we grapple with our text. So let's pray and get into God's Word. Lord, we thank you that um, this, this morning we, we get together as your people to sing songs of praise and worship to you, to fellowship with you, and at this point to sit under the Lordship of your Word. I pray that 
as I speak now, that you would um, quiet our hearts and minds and enable us to hear you speaking, that you would be at work by your spirit. Would you speak through my vocal cords? Would your people hear your voice? Would your people hear you? Would the Holy Spirit be at work here this morning? In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. The unfolding story. So how did we get here? Our first point. The first seven chapters of the book of Acts focus on the gospel of the good news being for the Jews. In chapter 8, we see persecution arise in the church, and we see the gospel scatter. Some travel to Samaria, which is north of Jerusalem, and we're introduced to the Ethiopian eunuch who travels south and are crossing to Africa. The Ethiopian eunuch is a Gentile, a quick side road. So Gentile means one who is not a Jew by birth, not originally part of God's chosen people. From the Jewish perspective, Gentiles don't know the one and true God. Jews consider Gentiles as unclean and refer to them as the uncircumcised. Jews are people whose religion is Judaism. Judaism is characterized by a belief in one transcendent God who revealed himself to Abraham, to Moses, and the Hebrew prophets. So Judaism is also characterized by a religious life and following the scriptures and rabbi teaching and traditions. What we will see as the story unfolds is that even though the Jews are God's chosen people, the Gentiles are also added as God's chosen people through a new covenant because of Jesus. So the Ethiopian eunuch who is a Gentile is how the gospel traveled south into Africa when persecution hit in Jerusalem. Also indicating how the gospel isn't a Western religion, as many might believe, as it traveled first south to the continent of Africa and north into more further into Middle East before it traveled west. As the gospel is spread, we see in Acts 10, God directs Peter and Cornelius to Cornelius' house in Caesarea, north of Jerusalem still, as the, as the gospel had moved. Cornelius is a Gentile, someone not born in Jerusalem. Peter, Peter preaches to those in the house, and all those in the house are saved and receive the good news. Some of the Jews object to the actions of Peter in sharing the good news with the Gentiles. But hearing what God is doing, the Jews have to start believing that God wants to save the Gentiles also. The church in Antioch, which was part of Paul's first missionary journey, also saw many Gentiles believing in the gospel. So when Paul and Barnabas return to Antioch, they find there's a theological issue. The issue is around circumcision as a practice that was to be observed by the Jews, being insisted as a practice that the Gentiles need to observe. This theological issue goes to the Jerusalem Council. That's how far this theological issue goes. The unfolding story in Acts 15. As we read Acts 15, we are about 15 years from the time of Jesus' death and resurrection. As we read Acts 15, we will also look at a section of text from Galatians to help us set the scene. Galatians 2, verse 11 to 16 says, But when Cephas went, came to Antioch, I, I opposed him to his face because he stood condemned. For he regularly ate with the Gentiles before certain men came from James. However, when they came, he withdrew and separated himself because he feared those from the circumcision party. Then the rest of the Jews joined his hypocrisy so that even Barnabas was led astray by their hypocrisy. But when I saw that they were even deviating from the truth of the gospel, I told Cephas in front of everyone, if you who are a Jew live like a Gentile and not like a Jew, how can you compel Gentiles to live like Jews? We are Jews by birth and not Gentile sinners, and yet because we know that a person is not justified by the works of the law, but by faith in Jesus Christ, even we ourselves have believed in Christ Jesus. This was so that we might be justified by faith in Christ and not by the works of the law, because by the works of the law, no human being will be justified. So Cephas is Peter. He is originally Simon from Bethsaida. Jesus meets him, calls him to follow him. Jesus gives him another name, Cephas, which is Aramaic. Paul calls him by his Aramaic name in this section. Peter here would regularly eat with the Gentiles, but he changes when certain men come from James. So James is a religious leader in the Jerusalem church. We will see him again in Acts 15. So the words from James here refers to people who are thought to be coming or thought to be sent by the church in Jerusalem. But we will learn soon that they were not sent by James or the church. The circumcision party is the same group of people, it's the same people that are coming or being supposedly sent from the church in Jerusalem. 
So the Apostle, Paul, the Apostle Peter's hypocrisy seems to cause and encourage others who have different views to be strengthened in their views about the Gentiles, about further practices that the Gentiles need to observe, and the Gentiles being, needing to be more like the Jews. We see that even Barnabas was impacted by Peter and Apostle's behavior. In Acts 15 verse 1, it says, Some men came down from Judea and began to teach the brothers, unless you're circumcised according to the custom prescribed by Moses, you cannot be saved. Acts 15 verse 5 says, But some of the believers who belonged to the party of the Pharisees stood up and said, It is necessary to circumcise them and to command them to keep the law of Moses. These people from the Pharisees' party are not teaching the gospel. They are targeting new believers they are demanding that the Gentile believers be circumcised and the Gentile believers keep the commands that's prescribed by the law of Moses, the Mosaic law, in order to be saved. So this party that comes from Jerusalem is not teaching the gospel, but is calling people to follow Jewish practices. This is what Paul says in Galatians 1 verse 6 to 9. I am amazed that you are so quickly turning away from him who called you by the grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel. Not that there is another gospel, but there are some who are troubling you and want to distort the gospel of Christ. But even if we or an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel contrary to what we have preached to you, a curse be on him. As we have said before, I now say again, if anyone is preaching to you a gospel contrary to what you received, a curse be on him. So we initially read from Galatians 2. We just read now from Galatians 1. This is, both be, this, this is before Paul opposes Peter, which we read in Galatians 2. Paul is seeing Peter and challenging his actions as if he's believing a different gospel, as if he's living a different gospel. The events detailed in Galatians and the opposition of Paul to the idea of circumcision being commanded to the Gentiles happens before the Jerusalem council sits in Acts 15. So both Galatians 1 and Galatians 2 happens before the council sits and before Peter stands up to address the council. In Acts 15 verse 2, we see that there's an intense debate. This debate includes Paul, it includes Barnabas, and it includes people from James, people from the church, the elders. So in Galatians, we see Paul rebuking Peter for his hypocrisy. We see Barnabas swayed by this false gospel, which is a gospel which includes circumcision and keeping Mosaic law in order to be saved. In Acts 15 verse 1 and Acts 15 verse 5, we see that the same people and influences of a gospel that includes circumcision are there. So Galatians 1 and Galatians 2 share the same story that we see in Acts 15, but come slightly before the Jewish council sits. Jerusalem Council sits. The unfolding story continues. We are at the Jerusalem Council at this point. Luke makes it clear that he is giving a summary about the debate or the conversations in verse 7 when he says, after much debate. He then summarizes only four individuals. Peter goes first, Paul and Barnabas go next, and, we only, and they, all, they only share one verse in this in the summary, and James seems to close off the debate with a longer nine verses, with a quote from the Old Testament as well. As we look at Peter's contribution to the debate, we should know that the context we've read is before 1 and 2 Galatians. So Peter was already rebuked, brought back to the light. He then contributes as the council sits. Peter contrasts the Jews and the Gentiles in his address. God chose to have the gospel heard by the Gentiles and saved. God calls Abraham, who is a Gentile. God blesses him and gives him a promise that through him, many people will come to be saved. This is all in Genesis 12, verses 1 to 3. So Peter points out that the Gentiles would also be saved and that the people in this debate all know this. Jews have the Holy Spirit and so do the Gentiles, verse 8. That's what Peter's saying. In verse 10, Peter says, or speaks about a yoke being placed on the Gentiles that the Jewish ancestors and all, and all of those listening can't actually bear or would not be able to bear. The Jewish leaders wanted the Gentiles to be circumcised as a rite of passage for salvation. Abraham was a Gentile, did this, but Peter is saying that the law does not save, that only God saves. Peter ends his address with this in verse 10 and 11. He made no distinction between us and them, cleansing their hearts by faith. 
Now then, why are you testing God by putting a yoke on the disciples? Next, that neither our ancestors nor we have been able to bear. On the contrary, we believe that we are saved through the grace of the Lord Jesus in the same way they are. Peter saying the Lord did not liberate or make them clean. Now we want to place the same law on the Gentiles. Why are we not accepting those who God has called and accepted already? This is what Peter says to the council. Peter says the Jews can be saved the same way as the Gentiles are saved, by faith and the grace of God. Remember, the Jews are God's chosen people. They had a covenant with God. This also included following the law of Moses and being circumcised, all as indications that they belong to the covenant. But Peter is saying, just like the Gentiles in the new covenant, faith in the grace of God is enough for salvation. This is the mic drop moment. Peter, who previously might have seemed to support the circumcision party, doesn't, address, doesn't support them as he stands before the council. Peter says, we actually need to be more like the Gentiles. And that's the mic drop moment. That's the moment where they're all quiet as they listen to his address. Peter says, the Lord does not save, that only God save. Paul makes a similar point as well in Romans 9 verse 30. What should we say then? Gentiles who did not pursue righteousness, meaning have not followed the law to make them right, have obtained righteousness, namely the righteousness that comes from faith meaning that righteousness is not from themselves. It's the righteousness of faith. Verse 31, but Israel pursuing the law of righteousness has not achieved the righteousness of the law. Why is that? Because they did not pursue it by faith, but as if it were by works. They stumbled over the stumbling stone. As, as it is written, look, I'm putting a stone in Zion to stumble over and a rock to trip over, and the one who believes on him will not be put to shame. Brothers and sisters, my heart's desire and prayer to God concerning them is for their salvation. I can testify about them that they have the zeal for God, but not according to knowledge, since they are ignorant of the righteousness of God and are tempted to establish their own righteousness. They have not submitted to God's righteousness. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes meaning Christ came to replace the law and grant righteousness, right standing with God to everyone who believes in him. So Peter's main point, Jews need to be more like the Gentiles and need to pursue righteousness through faith in Jesus. Jews need to be saved by grace alone, for they cannot make themselves right with God. The same as with the Gentiles. Salvation is the same for the Jews and salvation is the same for the Gentiles. That's that mic drop, drop moment. You can imagine the shock that the, that the people in the council have as he drops this mic. The whole assembly became quiet. Paul and Barnabas pick up the mic. Here's their one verse, Acts 15 verse 11. On the contrary, we believe that we are saved through the grace of the Lord Jesus in the same way they are. The whole assembly became silent and listened to Barnabas and Paul described all the signs and wonders God had done through them among the Gentiles. So Paul and Barnabas speak after Peter. They speak about the miracles and signs that happen among the Gentiles as they taught. These are the same as when they taught through Jerusalem, through Judea, and Samaria. So we saw this also in Acts 14 verse 2. The reason why Paul and Barnabas speak about the signs and wonders that happen among the Gentiles is to show that they are the same signs and wonders that happen when the preaching happened with the Jews. So this supports the same argument that Peter shared. Paul and Barnabas point to God. He called people to himself, and the people he called to himself include the Gentiles. James speaks next. At this point, it would also be easy to assume that James would, would say Christ plus Jewish law, because there was a group sent out that speak in the same way. But James turns to Scripture to substantiate the same point that Peter shared. Looks at Amos 9, verse 11 to 12. After these things, I will return and rebuild David's fallen tent. I will rebuild its ruins and set it up again so that the rest of humanity may seek the Lord. Even all the Gentiles who are called by my name, declares the Lord, who makes these things known from long ago. The reference here from Amos refers to David's kingdom. Israel has fallen. God had promised that David would have a descendant who would rule from the throne forever. Lord Jesus Christ is the son 
of David who will sit on the throne of his father. The restoration of the throne to Jesus will fulfill God's promise to save those Gentiles God had chosen for himself. The prophecy lives within the realm of being fulfilled but not yet fully fulfilled until the second coming of Jesus. So James is saying that God is rebuilding and restoring his nation already, which includes the Gentiles, as we have seen from the Gentiles being saved as Peter was at Cornelius' house, as, as well as Paul and Barnabas through their missionary travels. In Amos, we see that the Gentiles were long included in God's people. God set apart the people for himself that included the Gentiles. This process of rebuilding and restoring his nation, which includes the Gentiles, is how the Gentiles are called by his name as they are his. After quoting Amos, James then gives his words that the leaders and elders should not cause difficulties for those among the Gentiles who God calls to himself. So the unfolding story, James' final address. The words that follow in verse 20 from James seem like a contradiction, but they're not. James outlaws four things that the Gentiles should do. Abstain from things polluted by idols, from sexual immorality, from eating anything that has been strangled, and eating anything that has blood. Of the four things, one seems like it comes from the Ten Commandments, and others seem to be cultural things that James mentions. So why would James include one of the Ten Commandments and not the others? How would the original audience have received these four things that James gives? The four things that James mentions all precede the Ten Commandments. So having only one as sexual immorality, as one that comes from the Ten Commandments, does not nullify the others because this list of four things comes before the law of Moses was brought down the mountain for the Israelites. Also what is being said by Peter, Paul, Barnabas, and James is that is trying to keep the law of Moses, the Mosaic law will not help one be righteous or saved. James then shares four things that are universal instructions from God that help the believer individually in their walk, but also helps the witness of the believer towards unity. The first one of the four is abstain from things polluted by idols. So what is an idol? That's a great question. It, it is an image or representation of God, of God used as an object of worship. Anything that takes a place or position of God that we look to for answers and for life. So abstain from things tarnished by idol worship. This can be food. This can be practices. We were created to have a relationship with God. We are his image to the world. The original audience would know what this refers to. It refers to festivals and prominent celebrations of other gods that happened during this time. In this day and age, it is no different. We should abstain from practices and or food that is celebrating ancestral worship or other demonic forces which we look to answers for. The second thing James mentions is sexual immorality. Genesis 2 verse 24 to 25 establishes in the Bible the only place for sex. Therefore a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife and they shall become one flesh. And the man and his wife were both naked and were not ashamed. In context, Leviticus 17 and 18, God speaks to Moses to instruct in a very clear and specific way how the Israelites should participate, should not participate in sexual immorality, particularly amongst themselves, but this generally applies in general. In this day and age, there are terms like friends with benefits. Sex is celebrated by culture outside of marriage, but it shouldn't be. This is sexual immorality. So abstain from sexual immorality. It is no different as, as in what we see in Leviticus. We should leave sex to the context of one husband and one wife to the marriage bed, to the covenant of marriage. The last two things to be outlawed are eating anything that has been strangled and eating anything that has blood. Just to be sure, we're not talking about a medium rare steak here. <laughs> that is the right way to enjoy a steak after all. So Genesis 9 verse 2 to 4. This is after the flood has subsided. Noah and his family are kept safe. God blesses Noah and basically says, be fruitful and multiply. You can eat of the plants and flesh, but don't eat animals with their blood in. Leviticus 17 verse 11 says, for the life of a creature is in the blood, and I have appointed it to you to make atonement on the altar for lives, since it is the lifeblood that makes atonement. 
This simply alludes to life being in the blood. For sin, there should be punishment and the blood of the animal is part of the atonement. This is what happens in sacrifice. This also happens in this current day and age. Culturally, those who worship ancestors use the blood of animals to appease the ancestors or to try to appease the ancestors of which they don't exist. This, this goes back to point one. Abstain from things polluted by idols. Don't do it. But this shows that blood should not be eaten. God said, eat the plants, which I struggle with, but, but eat, eat the plants and eat flesh. Um, then I know some are asking, but the rare steak has blood. No. The slaughtering of an animal and letting the animal bleed out once dead is enough. Cooking the meat doesn't take away all the blood. It just changes the color. Maybe even chars the meat if you like it well done. So a like, so little bit like rubber. Don't, don't do it. Um, so stay with me here. Don't turn vegan yet. What, what, what is clear here is that food isn't blood. Otherwise, God would have said to Noah, eat the plants, the flesh, and blood. In Leviticus, God says this blood, should, this blood shouldn't be eaten. It says use a live animal and its blood as atonement of sin. Don't eat meat that has not been processed or killed and, and the blood let off. So medium rare steak is back on the table. <laughs> so I believe this will be enjoyed when the gents meet for the men's year end function. Yeah, for the ladies, we will try to eat the plants as well. Um, so not eating blood is important here in this day because there are practices where people drink blood in demonic ways or even eat someone just killed, some of which indicate the taking of the life force or the life power of someone through the blood. This was a problem in, this, in, the, in, the, in the day where, where we see this letter written, and it's a problem now, and that's why this is also applicable to us. So all four of these outlaw things mentioned by James precede the Ten Commandments. They speak about universal things that God told the Israelites not to do. So having these things here in Acts 15 as what James, a leader of the church, mentions should not be, be, be done um, should, should not be done by both the Jews and Gentiles, does not dis subtract the Ten Commandments or does not overshadow the Ten Commandments, but rather in context would have been in relation to laws before the Mosaic law, the law of Moses brought by the Ten Commandments. So these are also to be done in response to the gospel and not as a way to make one right. So James is saying salvation is by grace alone, but do these things for they will be good for you and good for the relations. A letter is then drafted by the elders and leaders to be sent to the churches along with a select group of men. This letter is sent back as a report of what has been discussed uh, along with a group of men. The, the reason why the group of men is there is because there was groups before that were supposedly coming from the church. And this letter is now addressing that there's men now we have sent that carry the true message. This letter brings encouragement as we'll see as we look at the four observations from the text. So the first observation, there was a danger during this time of the gospel, the good news about Jesus being perverted and watered down to be Christ plus works. The circumcision party was teaching a false gospel, a salvation that needs works. The same dangers of a perverted gospel exist today. We live in a time where culturally people profess to know Christ but also believe and support in the powers of demonic forces or in the, in the form of ancestors or mediums that connect them to the spiritual realm. The gospel is the word of God and has the power to save. The gospel is sufficient for salvation through the grace of God. This was the outcome of the Jerusalem meeting, that the grace of the Lord is what saves. The grace speaks to looking at what has already been done for you and not what you need to do for yourself. Most religions tell you what you need to do. Works and, uh, and Christianity speaks about looking at what has already been done for you and receiving that which has already been done for you. The basis of needing to do something to achieve your salvation must be premised on you being born with a clean slate. You are born neutral and can then do things to add to the good column. But Christianity teaches that you are born not only with a bad slate, but a dead slate. Here's an example that might help. Believing that you can do works to save yourself is like sitting in a boat that is in the ocean and seeing Jesus running on the shore and jumping into the ocean and drowning to show his love for you. Yet here is the truth. 
you aren't on the boat. You're actually at the bottom of the ocean. You have a brick on your chest, which is keeping you at the bottom of the ocean. You actually aren't even alive. You are dead and need resuscitation. You need to be made alive. We need a savior. We need Jesus who takes on our dead state and makes us alive with his death on the cross for us and reunites us with the Father. This is grace. This grace hinges on whether Jesus, as I mentioned, had died 15 years before this council meets. The person and the work of Jesus cannot be denied. They were eyewitnesses. Jesus appeared not only to one or two. First Corinthians 15, he appeared to the apostles and over 500 people. Manus manuscripts exist that real evidence of a living and resurrected Jesus. An empty tomb that was used, a stone that was rolled away. We are not conforming to the law. This is why the Jerusalem Council makes sure it's clear that the law does not save. We're conforming to the person of Jesus because of the grace that he gives. So second observation, the gospel is for everyone. As we have seen this morning, the movement of the gospel was from the Middle East in Jerusalem. There was conflict which caused the gospel to move both north and south. South was the gospel moving into Africa through the Ethiopian eunuch. Um, Peter, one of the people teaching and sa saving a family in Cornelius' house. This is north of where the gospel moved from. The gospel is not a Western religion. It first moved south and north before it even moved to the west. The gospel is a gospel for everyone. Anyone who would receive the grace that is freely given. If you're unsure about this, you need to read the Bible for yourself. You need to look at the, the book of Mark or the book of John and just pray to God to show you himself walking off the pages of Scripture. The gospel is for everyone. The third observation in our passage, circumcision was a symbolic act that was placed as a requirement for salvation for the Gentiles. We see this as the circumcision party uses this as a rite of passage for the Gentiles. If we contrast circumcision and baptism, baptism is actually an act of obedience indicating that one identifies with Christ's death, resurrection, and ascension. Circumcision was for the Jews to be like a Jew. Baptism is for all who have put their faith and trust in God. Circumcision made someone a Jew while baptism makes someone a Christian. In the Old Testament, God created a people for himself through the act of circumcision. This is where the practice came from. This act came to signify your identity. In the New Testament, God separates a people for himself through the act of baptism. This act comes once you are ready in Christ to confirm what is already done inside the heart. Adding works or even cultural practices as a condition for salvation undermines the work of Christ on the cross. Jesus Christ came to save those that are lost and need a savior. Putting works in front of salvation is saying that Jesus' death was not sufficient or saying that you don't need a savior, but you're not in the boat, you're down in the ocean, trapped by the sin of the brick that holds you down. You need a savior. No works or practices can grant someone salvation. No popularity can grant someone salvation. Salvation is God's gift to give alone, and the death of Jesus on the cross for our sins is all that is needed to receive this gift. Of grace. Here's a quote from John Piper. The blood of Christ obtained for us not only, can, not only the cancellation of sin, but also the conquering of sin. This is the grace we live under, the sin conquering, not, sin, not just sin cancelling grace of God. Jesus conquered sin so that we might live this, this is the grace of God. By grace alone we are saved. Grace is central and foundation to what God is doing in salvation. Acts 15, verse 11. On the contrary, we believe that we are saved to the grace of the Lord Jesus in the same way they are. To reject grace and include works as robbing God of the glory that belongs only to him. Fourth observation. I want to again support what Reino said in the last two sermons. In verse 14, we see that God is at work and that, that part of the work is enabling us to share the gospel with others. Remember, we have the Holy Spirit in us. Peter visits Cornelius but God visits the house of Cornelius himself, takes initiative through Peter to take out and save a people for himself. God visited uncircumcised Gentiles, people who were not part of his people, and the instrument that God used to take a people for himself is Peter. We are called to be on mission also. 
to share the gospel that we know, to pray, to ask the Holy Spirit to help us. Here's how you can do that. You don't have to be in a foreign land. But if you're a teacher, if you're a mother, if you're a father, if you're a creative, a business owner, a scholar, a gym card carrying member, an active member of your community, Amos, whom we read about, was not a prophet or a priest or the son of either. He was a shepherd and a businessman, and God used him, and he became a powerful voice for change. God can use you. Just share your story. Just share your story. Last observation, chapter 15 was a pivotal chapter within the life of the early church. Jews were seen as God's people. From Acts 10, we could already see Gentiles being saved as well by the apostles. This chapter introduces salvation by grace alone for the Jews and Gentiles and affirms that both Jews and Gentiles are the same. Jews and Gentiles are saved in the same way by grace, by the same death of Jesus on the cross. What should we do with this message? If you're a believer, you should be encouraged. The apostles with Silas and and Judas returned to the church in Antioch and shared the news with the Jerusalem council, and the church was encouraged. Encouraged that salvation is by grace alone. Encouraged that you are included in the salvation by grace alone. They were included and we are included. Encouraged that you you have seen and know the real Jesus, and we live in a time of divine rebuilding. God is rebuilding the ruins of his people. We live and will experience hardship. We will experience despair, hurt, and God will continue to rebuild and repair until the second coming of Jesus, if we have put our faith and trust in him. If you're not a Christian, then this is also great news for you. That you are also included and God wants to have a relationship with you. God wants to give you new life. You are included only because of what Jesus has done on the cross. Jesus jumps into the ocean to remove the block of sin and idolatry that's keeping you at the bottom of the ocean. Jesus jumps in to save your life in place of his. That's the great news if you're not a believer here this morning, that God wants to have a relationship with you, and only by grace and the death of Jesus on the cross you have that life if you accept him. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we we thank you that you are Lord, that you are God, and that you're in control. We thank you that you have made a way for all nations to be part of your covenant, and that way is through the death of Jesus Christ on the cross. We thank you that we don't have to work for our salvation, but our salvation is already done and seen in the person of Christ on the cross for our sins. We pray that you help us to accept this finished work of Christ that you grant and give us. We pray that this would be an encouragement if we're believers. We pray that this would be the reason we live because of a Christ who died on the cross for us to redeem us back to yourself. We thank you for your goodness in sending Jesus to die on the cross for our sins. And if we don't know you this morning, I pray that we would be drawn to you, that your Holy Spirit would be at work calling and drawing those who don't know you to yourself, that they may come to a working knowledge of who Jesus is, that Jesus came and died on the cross to save a people for himself. And if we have put our faith and trust in him, we are that people. We thank you for your goodness. We thank you for your love. We thank you that we can be called children of God, not because of what we do, but because of what you have done. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.